Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Today's a very exciting day in the shop because we're going to take the D-bit grinder the rest of the way home. In previous videos, you saw me rebuild the workhead and the spindle. Now we're going to do everything else. Before this video is done, you're going to see first chips. Well, dust. Let's go. Okay, to dismantle the body of the machine here, we gotta start by taking this bar out. This is like the ways of the machine, and there's a spring-loaded cap at one end that preloads the whole assembly, and then there's this micrometer adjustment at the other end. So uh, the only fastener on the whole thing is this little set screw on the micrometer knob, so we'll start by fishing that guy out of there. And then that knob slides off nicely. And you can see how nice the markings are on here. These must have been photo etched. They're really beautifully done and that knurling is absolutely perfect. Okay, so let's try taking these screws out next. There's some kind of a bronze bushing here that's enclosing the rest of the assembly. Oh, no, actually, it's just an outer ring that comes off, and that's the uh, markings ring for the micrometer. I guess that's a separate part, so they can easily swap that out for uh, metric or imperial. So now there's this bronze bushing that spins but doesn't come all the way out. Something is stopping it. So let's see if we can have a look underneath at what's going on. So uh, you can see we've got only the finest German cardboard here that forms the bottom of the machine. So we'll take these screws out of that. And from underneath, we can see that, uh, in fact, there's nothing else to come out except these nuts on the end. And uh, you may recall that I made these tools before for uh, the nuts that were on the workhead. And I was pretty proud of myself for making these tools because I, I knew I was going to be able to use them here as well. And well, guess what? These nuts are different size metric fist shake and uh, so I guess we got to make another one so I go back to the Chinese socket junk box and pick out another one and this is the same process that you saw me use before to make a custom socket I just mark out where the uh, teeth need to be and I take out the bulk of the material with the angle grinder I square up the edges on each tooth with a cutoff disc and that gives us the rough shape like so and then I go in and I refine that shape with the Dremel tool and once we're close, I can see the teeth are the right size, but it still won't go on, and that's because of the thickness of the teeth. So then I gotta go on the inside with a sanding disc on the Dremel and uh, make the teeth thinner, and now it fits on there very nicely. So now we can use that on a ratchet handle to get those nuts out of there, and hopefully we'll get some movement out of that bar. And I actually just use the uh, lock there to keep it from spinning. And then it comes loose pretty easily. That guy wasn't actually very tight. So those look the same as the ones that were holding the workhead on, but uh, in fact they're a slightly different size for some annoying reason. Oh, okay, and looks like there's also a thrust bearing underneath that guy, so we'll gotta keep track of that for later. And now this bronze bushing unthreads just as we hoped it would. Here's the other half of that thrust bearing in there. So the thrust bearings ride against the spring tension provided by the cap on the other end of the bar and keep the whole assembly tight and precise. And that bronze bushing needs a cleaning, but otherwise looks to be in very good shape. So now I'll take these uh, locks out. These locks keep the uh, bar from moving while you're grinding, and, and they might keep us from being able to remove the bar. So get those out of there. And, and the big knob is a rotation stop, and we'll take that out as well. And now this piece slides right out, and there's another thrust bearing behind that. And uh, we've got this uh, angle stopper deal on the inside, but there's nothing holding it in place. I removed a set screw from that. And so now the bar should just tappy tap tap right out. Oh, and we can see that it's moving. So it's looking good. I wasn't sure if there might be anything else stopping it, but uh, it does in fact come out now. So uh, it's moving pretty well. And we can slide the remaining piece of the workhead off of there. And Bob's your uncle, we got that bar out. Very nice. So that bar might need a little cleaning, but it looks to be in good shape. And so now we got to take apart the base of the workhead here. This was the last piece that we couldn't get to. And as usual, the handle that tightens it onto the bar is uh, incredibly tight. And some tapping on the screwdriver worked to loosen that guy. And the locking mechanism on this is actually pretty interesting. It's a two-part brass or bronze bushing. So there's two pieces there and they both have a piece of the curve cut out of them that fits around the bar and so the uh, locking handle just tightens the two halves together and that's what locks it against the bar. So that's kind of a cool mechanism. And then being bronze they're soft and so they won't mar up the, uh, the precision bar that they're uh, riding on. 
Okay, next we gotta get this marking ring off, and that's got three set screws in it, it looks like, so we'll pull those guys off. That guy's very stuck on there with a lot of grit, but eventually it does come off. And this is a bit curious. Some of the set screws have distinctive marks drilled in where they go, and some of them don't. And uh, the ones that do, the drill marks are different depths, so I'm not sure what's going on there. But there are definitely supposed to be three set screws in there. And we can take this little marker plate off as well, and all of these parts are in good condition. Mostly they just need cleaning. That guy's got a little bit of rust on it, so it'll go in the evapo rust for an hour or so. The next thing I'm going to do is uh, tackle cleaning up the bar. Now it's in good shape, but it's got uh, crud and some scoring on it, and uh, otherwise I uh, could use a bit of a polish. So I'm going to chuck it up in the fore jaw, and I'm chucking on that spring-loaded end cap, but uh, we're not going to be putting a lot of forces on this. I just want it to spin. And luckily it's already got a center in the other end from how it was made. And I'm going to put some cloth on the ways here to protect it from all of the horrible things that we're about to do. So I'll start by cleaning it up with some fine Scotch-Brite. And next I'm going to go in there with some 1000 grit emery paper. And I'm using WD-40 as a lubricant here. And I worked my way up to 2000 grit. And I may have even done some 2500 there. And then I come in with some metal polish and a rag and uh, just work on that polish in there. And after some quality time with all of that, that bar is looking very nice and smooth indeed. It's not quite as good as the factory polish would have been, but uh, it's certainly good enough. And here's that bronze bushing, and a little bit of Scotch-Brite cleans that guy up like new. Now the main body has two castings, and I want to be able to separate them, but uh, the motor capacitor here and also the main power cord are mounted to the lower casting, but run through holes in the upper casting, or are attached to things in the upper casting. So I'm going to start by removing the power cord. So I'll take this uh, very important safety cardboard off there. It's uh, really uh, saving lives. And then we'll unscrew these uh, terminals here, and that plug comes off, and now we can undo this strain relief back here. I don't think this strain relief is factory. It's plastic and uh, in pretty bad shape, actually. And uh, so we'll remove that guy, and now we can fish the power cord through there, because of course the power cord is attached to the switch and the motor, which are both attached to the upper casting. Okay, I think I have enough to where I can separate the castings, and looking from the bottom here, there are some big cap screws and possibly some small nuts holding it all together. So we'll get those big cap screws out of there. And uh, they uh, are Loctited in place, so they're a little stiff. I'll remember that. Makes sense to Loctite them uh, when I put them back in. Everything here is vibrating, because this is a grinder after all. And I'll get those little nuts out of there as well. I can't tell for sure if those little nuts are holding anything, but I'll take them out just in case. And with some persuasion and some praying to Metallicor, the machining gods, the parts do finally separate. And this is where I learned that those little nuts actually were just holding alignment pins in place. So it makes sense that there would be alignment pins. The alignment of these castings is actually critical because the uh, main bar that weighs goes through both castings. As you can see, one end is in the lower casting, the other end is in the upper castings. So the alignment of these uh, two castings is pretty critical. Okay, the castings are separate, but they're still held in by the wiring on that motor capacitor. So to disconnect that, I'm going to have to get access to the other end of it, because the capacitor has no connections on it. So we'll take the uh, power knob off here, take that cover plate off, and uh, these screws were all quite seized in there. I think there's some dissimilar metals happening here, so there was a lot of corrosion over the years on those guys. So they took some coil and some hammering to persuade out of there. Now I get a look at the back of that switch, and there's quite a bit going on back there, so I'm going to put some tape on there and start labeling things. And with that motor capacitor out, I can now get the motor itself out. So it's just held to the upper casting with these four big cap screws, also Loctited in place for obvious reasons. And those guys are interesting. They have a shallow head on them, but otherwise they look pretty standard. And now that casting should lift right off of there, and it, indeed it does. Okay, so aside from being utterly filthy, the motor looks to be in pretty decent shape. And just to keep things interesting, there's a couple of stray ground wires coming from the switch and the motor still in there. So we fished that out, and now we finally have the entire electrical system free of the grinder. And now I can give this upper casting a thorough cleaning, 
and uh, the mating surfaces that are machined on this casting are all pretty rusty. I don't have a big enough container to dunk the whole thing, but I, luckily I can just dunk the uh, edges that are uh, exposed there. So I set them on the lid of uh, another container just to keep them elevated off the bottom of the tank, and they came out very nice indeed. And then I do the same with the other mating surface that's on this casting. And that also came out like new. And as I go along, I'm just putting those screws back in where they all came from because while it looks like I'm doing all of this in rapid succession, these, some of these videos are weeks apart and I don't remember where everything goes. And then that post comes out of the bottom casting. I think that's an accessory post for mounting a lamp or something. Now the base casting is too big to dunk even in my uh, tank of evaporust that I have here, so I'm just doing a mechanical removal of the rust on that. And we can unscrew the motor capacitor from underneath and give the motor itself a little bath. I'm just using simple green diluted one to one here. And here's the motor itself. It uh, looks to be in pretty decent shape other than being filthy. And in fact, the main power cord for the grinder is also incredibly filthy. I actually thought it was uh, black, but it's actually <laughs> light gray. So uh, once I got all that grit cleaned off of there, I could take a closer look at the connections inside the motor here. We'll just make sure everything's okay in here. There's no signs of burning or anything. This lid has not been off in a very long time, so it took some persuading, but off it comes, and yeah, everything looks great in there, so nothing to be concerned about there. So obviously I'm not going to touch all those connections, it's already wired for single phase, 120 volt, which is what I want. Now at this point I wanted to rig up the motor and see how it runs, because I haven't actually seen it run yet. So uh, I figured oh, I'll set up some elaborate test jig to hold the motor and the switch, and then I realized I already have such a fixture, I have the top casting, so I just kind of temporarily reinstalled everything back in the top casting the way it was and rigged it up just enough to where I can power it up. And then of course I have to put the power plug back on, reinstall that safety cardboard, very important. Many, many lives have been saved. And here goes. Hey, look at that, the motor actually runs. So that's good news. It does sound a little bit noisy though. I'll bring you in close to the back here so you can have a listen. I think I hear bearing noise in the back of this motor. So since I have the whole thing apart anyway, I might as well do this right. So I packaged it up and I took it over to an electric motor shop and had them rebuild it. I don't really have a big enough press to try and change the bearings in this thing myself and there might be other things wrong in there. So got it back from the motor shop. Now it's quiet as a mouse. So I did one more mock-up with my test rig here and now the motor runs beautifully. Sounds fantastic. So now I can take it apart and reassemble it for real. So since the motor was just running and I'm about to touch this capacitor, I discharge it with a heavy screwdriver just in case. You don't mess with big capacitors. There's one small electrical upgrade I want to do though. Here's the main power cord and it's got these nice ring terminals on it. But uh, the internal wiring on the grinder has these uh, basic screw terminals with a little plate that squish the wires. And uh, these types of connections are not good. They fail all the time. Let's talk about these crimp connectors for a second because a lot of people think they aren't good. But they have a bad reputation because of these piece of garbage crimp pliers that everybody buys from the auto parts store. Throw those away. The problem is that people don't use proper crimping tools. This is a ratcheting crimper that has replaceable dies in it and it crimps in two places to the exact right tension. And it comes with different dies. You can get ones for coax and molex and all sorts of things. But the secret to it is that it crimps once on the insulation of the wire and then again on the wire itself and it crimps to different amounts in those different areas. And because it's ratcheting and controls the torque, you squeeze it once and it automatically releases at the exact right amount of pressure. And so it squeezes for a very strong bond on the insulation and the wire and it doesn't damage anything. And that is a very strong connection. That will never fail. There's a reason that we use only mechanical crimp connections in cars. It's a high vibration environment. And mechanical crimps actually fare better than soldering or any other type of connection in, in that environment. You know what else is a high vibration environment? A tool and cutter grinder. All right, give me a moment to climb down off my crimp connector high horse here. And now we can start reassembling these two castings that are all cleaned up. In fact, uh, we, I guess we're officially in the reassembly phase now on this grinder, which is kind of a big deal. So I'll put the motor capacitor back in there and you can see there's a notch down here that was for the factory routing of this wire, but uh, apparently someone changed this capacitor and has a shorter wire on it now. So they drilled this hole up here in the casting to route the wire. The problem is my highfalutin crimp connectors don't fit through that hole. And there isn't room to enlarge that hole, so I'm just going to instead make it into a notch with a little hacksaw and a little bit of deburring so it doesn't damage the wire. Now that roots in there just fine. 
And now we can start reassembling the casting. So I'm putting the bolts back in, I'm putting some Loctite on them just like they were from the factory. And I'm not really a huge fan of this chintzy plastic strain relief, so I put a zip tie on there to act as a little extra insurance, and that should be nice and sturdy now. So now I can rewire everything uh, for good and put it all back together. Luckily I labeled everything because there's a lot of wires. And one more test run, and that's running great. So hopefully that's uh, it for the electrical. It should be all back together once and for all. Now let's talk about thrust bearings again. You remember these little guys? There's two of them we pulled out of the micrometer assembly, and they're in kind of bad shape, but I was hoping to maybe just clean them up and reuse them. And uh, here's why. I went to go uh, replace these guys, and these guys come in a bunch of different sizes, and you can see they're all a couple of dollars a piece, pretty cheap. At this small size, they come in two common sizes. They, uh, they all have an interior dimension of 10 millimeters, and they come in a 24 millimeter OD, and, then, and those guys are $1.75, yeah, no problem, right? And then there's the other common size, which is a 10 millimeter ID and a 22 millimeter OD, which is what I have. These guys, survey says, are $20 each. I have no idea why this slightly different size is 20 times the price, but here we are. So that's why I wanted to try and reuse these old ones. I soaked them in WD-40 for a while. You can see all the grit that came out of them. And I tried oiling them up, but even with that, they sound awful. They sound like someone's rubbing two pieces of sandpaper together. So I could not in good conscience put these bearings back in this machine. So I dipped into the Patreon kitty, bought the right bearings, waited two weeks for them to be special ordered. And here they are, very excited to put the right bearings back in this machine. Now let's talk about the drive belt. So you might recall the old one was in pretty good shape, and uh, so I tried putting it back together, glued it and hold, so I figured, all right, I should do this right, get a new belt. And uh, so I needed to know how big the old one was, and uh, unfortunately the uh, parts diagram that I have for this machine doesn't list the actual dimensions of the drive belt. They just have a 50-year-old part number for it. So I put some string around there and uh, just uh, tie it uh, reasonably snug, and amusingly uh, that would actually probably run that way and then cut that string apart and measure it on a ruler, which is an inch too short, so get a larger ruler, and then measure that guy, and that comes out to 18.75 inches, 476 millimeter, and then the width of the groove on the pulley is about five millimeters. So uh, I looked at the round belts on McMaster, which are all in Imperial. This is uh, clearly intended to be a, a metric belt because everything else on the machine is metric. McMaster doesn't actually sell round belts in metric dimensions. Uh, but I did uh, look over on Artco Tools, which uh, they sell replacement parts for the original Deckel SO grinder. And it turns out that uh, the original Deckel machine used the, uh, a belt that was 480 by four millimeters. So that's almost certainly the same belt. So uh, I went ahead and ordered that guy. And through the magic of YouTube, here it is. And uh, note that this isn't the typical uh, like rubber round belt. This is some kind of uh, a braided cord. And I don't know if that's important, but uh, it is what's specified for the machine. So I'm glad to be able to have found it. And then we're gonna reassemble the base of the workhead real quick. Now there's one interesting feature on this guy that I wanna show you. Uh, there's three set screws that set up this ring, but uh, look what happens if I rotate the ring the set screw dimples no longer line up. That's really clever. So that guarantees that you get the ring properly aligned on the uh, workhead itself. Pretty cool. It's a good tip for your uh, for your own projects that you might be designing. Now back to our friend, the miniature thrust bearings. So here's the original bearings. Each one has a thrust washer associated with it. And the overall thickness of the assembly is four millimeters. And uh, yeah, I misread that website that I showed you earlier, and the four millimeter thickness was just for the bearing, not including the thrust washer. So these bearings are too thick. And uh, I waited weeks for these bearings, and uh, they weren't the right ones. So then, a little more Googling, I found these ones that, ch that are the right ones. These are from Pegasus Racing. They were great. They shipped them right out, had them in a couple of days, no problem. Meanwhile, these bearings were from that site that I showed you. Uh, turns out this company is in France, and they uh, delayed this order by weeks. They weren't responding to emails or phone calls. I finally threatened to cancel the order, and then they finally shipped them. It was a giant mess trying to get these bearings, and I was really unhappy with uh, how that interaction went. And uh, then, yeah, the Pegasus Racing bearings didn't come with the thrust washers, but that's okay. I just cleaned up the old ones and reused them. During this little reassembly montage, I want to thank some YouTubers who've been a huge help to me on this project. First, uh, the Tool and Die Guy. He has a great tutorial video series for the on-label purpose of this machine, grinding D-bits. 
And uh, next up is uh, Robin Renzetti, who has a couple of great videos on these machines. Uh, of course, Stefan Godsventer, who I've mentioned before. He's probably the guy that suddenly made this the year of the D-bit grinder on YouTube. Everybody suddenly wanted one. And I also want to thank Uchol over at Woods Creek Workshop, who did a complete restoration on a Deckel D-bit grinder. He did a great job, and his video was also super helpful to me. So I'll link to all of these YouTubers down below in the description. This micrometer assembly at the end here, I actually had to take this thing apart and reassemble it about six times before I got it right. Uh, there was some uh, tricky aspects to getting the lateral alignment of it just right. You have to get everything arranged so that this arm here uh, lines up with the hole where that uh, stopper screw comes through. And uh, yeah, the, the micrometer nut has a lot more movement on it than is necessary, and so you kind of get to choose your horizontal spot for the entire assembly. Uh, so luckily, uh, I got it figured out eventually and was able to set the backlash with those nuts and then put the dial back on and there we go. So when you've got it set up right, the arm there, the stopper arm, kind of acts as a lateral stop as well against the casting there. So you get the full half inch range of motion on it. And this is a piece of sheet metal that I salvaged from an old furnace that was in this building. And this is the original cardboard bottom, and it's in very bad shape. It's warped, and the screw holes are all torn out. So I'm going to remake the bottom out of sheet metal. So I'm going to uh, trace this guy here onto this piece of scrap. This furnace was uh, built in 1962. Yeah, it will live on again as the bottom for my D-bit grinder. So I cut the basic outline with the bandsaw, and then I drilled out the corners of this oddly shaped opening. And then I connected the dots with the diamond wheel on the Dremel, and uh, that came out of there quite nicely. And now we have a nice fit for the original part, so we'll do a test fit on there, and it seems to fit. And it feels very solid, but it is sheet metal, so it might rattle. So I uh, flipped the grinder over and ran it just to make sure, and nope, runs really quietly, so we're all set. I want to strip the old paint off and repaint it, and I don't want to remove this paint mechanically because it's from 1962. There's a good chance there's lead in it, something like that. So I'm going to use citrus strip to remove it chemically. And uh, citrus strip is amazing. I've never, ever had it fail. Put the stuff on an hour later, paint is bubbling off, works on oil paint, enamel paint, everything. Citrus strip is amazing stuff. I've never seen it fail and nothing. Didn't even touch it. Well, that got me curious because I've never seen citrus strip fail before. So I did a little bit of research and citrus strip is one of these uh, newer generation of milder paint strippers. Uh, traditional paint strippers are based on like benzene or uh, methylene chloride, which are really bad for you. And uh, citrus strip, the active ingredient in that is something called dimethyl glutarate, and there's also dimethyl adipate in it. Those are very mild alternatives to methylene chloride that work much slower. However, it still didn't attack this paint. Now, one thing that's known about those compounds is that they don't work very well on lead-based paint. So there may in fact be lead in this furnace paint. The other alternative is because it's from a furnace, it might be high temperature paint. And high temperature paint uh, typically don't use volatile organics as the base, as the binder. Uh, they use something like a silicone binder, and uh, traditional paint strippers will not attack that either. So for those, you got to use something like uh, methyl ethyl ketone uh, to remove that. So uh, yeah, I went with plan B. I just uh, scuffed it up a little bit and decided to just paint over it. If there is lead in that paint, it's just going to be locked away forever. Much like my previous employer did to me, I hung this out to dry and reassembly montage. And so now it's finally time to refit the workhead, and uh, I actually couldn't get it to seat down properly. It wouldn't go all the way in. So uh, I uh, took it apart and had a look, and here's how this guy goes on. There's a main bolt that goes down through the center of the whole assembly, and this roll pin goes through the center. Now the trick is this roll pin has to fit in that little slot. So I had to take it down and grind it off, and then the roll pin actually has to sit in there off center. And I remember when I took this apart, you can in fact see this in one of my earlier videos in this series, that the roll pin was short and off center. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, I can make that better. I'll put a proper length roll pin in there nicely centered. Yeah, well, sometimes things have a reason that you don't yet understand. So be careful about thinking that you're smarter than factory engineers. And there's one other little problem with the workhead. You can see that the uh, range of motion is actually incorrect. It's off by 90 degrees, so I had to disconnect uh, those nuts on the end and uh, shift it to the other side of one of the internal stops and then reattach it, and now it moves correctly. Luckily, I had made those tools for those nuts, so it was an easy fix. 
Okay, time for a test run. So I'm fitting a 600 grit diamond cup wheel to the original Arbor. I got this guy on eBay. Domestically, these guys are like $200 a piece. On eBay, you can buy them for 30 bucks. And according to uh, Stefan, the uh, eBay ones are actually uh, just fine. Set this up with a piece of scrap tool steel that I have here. And uh, yeah, I know you're not supposed to grind uh, steel with diamond, but uh, both Robin Renzetti and Stefan Gotswinter say that this is fine. They use the 600 grit diamond wheel for everything. And those two guys have forgotten more about machining than I will ever know. So uh, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So after a little uh, test flat spot there, nothing exploded. So I went in and tried a little circular grinding, see if we can put a chamfer on this piece of scrap. And obviously my technique needs a lot of work here and I still have to adjust all the stops and things, but uh, it, uh, well, it's making dust, so that's, uh, that's real progress. It's pretty exciting. It seems to run really smooth, everything's quiet, and everything moves nicely. Very pleased with this so far. And that turned out great. Uh, there's a couple of flat spots there. I need to work on my technique a little bit, but uh, it makes dust, and uh, the finish is great. So very pleased with this so far. There's still a lot to do. i got to sort out dust collection. There's still uh, that one thou run out in the collets that I want to sort out, and uh, some various little adjustments and things. But so far, this thing is really shaping up nicely. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.